Hi guys, welcome back. We shall now be talking about bronchial asthma and its diagnostic features. The main diagnostic criteria for bronchial asthma is reversibility of airflow obstruction that is to be demonstrated by performing spirometry. I will make the patient perform some practice deep inspiration expiration forceful inspiration forceful expiration and once the person is used to my commands then I will notice that uh, the person will be able to breathe in and then breathe out and this kind of a curve will be obtained as a flow volume curve. The patient will be upgrading from residual volume to total lung capacity that's the max that the lungs can handle and then he will try to breathe out and the residual volume is the least amount of air that could be present in the lungs because our lungs never empty. In an asthmatic patient you will notice that the baseline curve for inspiration part will remain the same. But in the expiration part, you will notice that an asthmatic patient will not be able to push air out of his lungs like a normal person. Asthma is a disease of expiration, so there will be a marked concavity in the expiratory part of the curve. You will now be giving salbutamol to the patient and if you repeat the same test after let me say 10 or 15 minutes of giving salbutamol, you will notice that this concavity will become significantly reduced. The computer can do some mathematical calculations and can, can tell you in percentage how much is the improvement in the expiratory flow rate of the patient. This is what is precisely represented in this printout of the actual patient. You can notice the green curve is pre-treatment recording of the patient and the red is the post-treatment recording of the patient. You can notice that there is a scooped out or a concavity part in the expiration with respect to a flow volume curve but that has substantially improved after giving salbutamol or short acting beta to agonist to the patient. What I wanted to highlight here before you is that asthma is a reversible airway disorder. Reversibility can be demonstrated by giving a short acting beta to agonist in the patient. In the exam he has asked that what should be the change of FEV1 before and after giving salbutamol so that you can say that patient is responding to your treatment or is rather a patient of bronchial asthma. Please notice that I have written FEV1 becoming normal. Normalization of FEV1 in asthma is definitely a possibility because in asthma we have exacerbations. So patients when they are not having exacerbations their FEV1 can be normal or pretty close to normal. Do remember that the change of FEV1 before and after salbutamol should be at least 12% or in mathematical values can be remembered as a 200 ml increment over the baseline value of FEV1 in the patient to say that yeah this is a patient of bronchial asthma. From historical perspective, I can also mention a test called as methacholine provocation test. But as the name suggests, provocation tests can really be dangerous in a sense that there could be uh, a bronchospasm so severe that he might land up into even imminent respiratory failure. So nowadays we do not do a methacholine provocation test but this is of historical importance who has been mentioned here. Another test that is mentioned in Harrison is uh, eucapnic hyperventilation test. Here the person will be made to breathe in cold air. You will notice that asthmatics have bronchial hyperreactivity to cold air. If an asthmatic goes to a hill station, he falls sick. In winter season, an asthmatic falls sick. Sitting in front of air condition of the cold blast of air can make an asthmatic person sick. So here we are simply using physiology. He breathes in cold air and he starts having difficulty in breathing. The FEV1 will downgrade. If he stops doing that, the FEV1 will come back to normal. So therefore, the main diagnostic criteria for bronchial asthma is reversibility of airflow obstruction. And this is not going to be seen in COPD. COPD is a non-reversible airflow obstructive airway disease whereas asthma is reverse has is called as a reversible airway disease and the cutoff for reversibility is what I've explained here. The second feature in bronchial asthma that you will always notice is episodicity. Every time there is exposure to dust, pollution, cold environment, there could be an attack developing in a patient, and most of the attacks of asthma are nocturnal. The only explanation for why attacks are nocturnal is uh, that night time the air is relatively colder so cold air can trigger bronchospasm out of the three criteria the first one is an absolute and a must criteria for demonstration of asthma otherwise i said episodic attacks nocturnal attacks if you have all of these three things demonstrated you are bang on target for diagnosing asthma in a patient the main test for diagnosis of asthma is spirometry chest x-ray has no importance in diagnosis 
during an asthma exacerbation because there is trapping of air in the lungs there is hyperinflation of the lungs so you can get a flattening of the diaphragms but otherwise asthmatics could be having a normal chest x-ray like us there is no rule of hrct chest for diagnosis of asthma but there is a complication that is seen with bronchial asthma called as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergilloma it is associated with aspergillus fumigatus it's a hypersensitivity reaction to the fungus which is associated with central bronchitis i have explained the features of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergilloma in the topic of bronchitis you can listen to that there but the highlight what i want to tell you is if an asthmatic is having brownish sputum plugs and a ct scan of the patient is done it shows a central bronchitis then the diagnosis of this asthmatic should be kept as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergilloma this is a hypersensitivity reaction to the colonization of the airways by this fungus this fungus could be present in the lungs of yours and mine also and we are supposed to give steroids and later on itraconazole for management of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergilloma the learning is a hrct chest is the best test for parenchymal lung disease but asthma you don't need to do a ct scan or HR CT chest because most of the time in asthmatics the x-ray would be normal except for this complication which I have handled here. We will now talk about the update for management of asthma. I mean why did I have to revise this lecture is primarily because of what I say next 2 or 3 minutes before you. Uh, all through in previous 30 years of medical literature and almost 15 years of my medical teaching, I have been teaching that best drug for acute attack of asthma is Saba and the best drug for prevention of asthma is Laba that is long acting beta 2 agonist. However, the update in 2019 has shaken this data to the core. I repeat the information. It was documented in the books that the best drug for acute attack of asthma is Saba that is short acting beta 2 agonist period that is what I was teaching that is what I have learned that is what I have taught your seniors. But look at what the current update says. He says Gina does not recommend Saba only treatment of asthmatics. Looks very surprising. He has said although Saba is highly effective for quick relief of asthma symptoms evidence a patients whose asthma care is performed with salbutamol alone are at increased risk of asthma related deaths this is a total revolution in the treatment of asthma per se because you see salbutamol was like you know the king in the entire description of bronchial asthma and now he says don't use salbutamol alone because of two reasons one obviously salbutamol if you use daily it can cause tachyphylaxis in person will become tolerance but more importantly they have said that asthma is basically inflammatory lung disease it's inflammation in the airways that needs to be suppressed with steroids if you treat an asthmatic only with saba it is like treating only the symptom you are not treating the disease and therefore the complication rates can increase the severity of the disease can man increase manifold and an attack can be so bad that person can die so the current update states that instead of using only salbutamol for the patient you are supposed to do what i teach you next he has mentioned controller medication controller would mean the medication that will prevent attacks of asthma and then is reliever that will take care of acute attack of asthma for controller earlier that is prevention we were studying laba long acting beta 2 agonist in the update he has mentioned for controller that is preventing attacks of asthma it is low dose inhaled corticosteroids with formaterol formaterol is a rapid acting laba it is a rapid acting long acting beta 2 agonist for reliever also he says it is low dose inhaled corticosteroid with formaterol looks very surprising he's saying that during an acute attack also give low dose steroids with formaterol to the patient and if required increase the dose like for example somebody is already on low dose inhaled corticosteroid and formaterol budesonide formaterol combination under my care after the diwali season the pollution spiked up the air quality index you know became really really bad there was smog there was mist everywhere and the person is deteriorating what will i do i will increase the dose of this to up to four times or normal if no improvement then i will add saba then i will add oral corticosteroids i will teach you the treatment of acute exacerbation as we progress but this is a very marked shift from what we have studied earlier i repeat my statement earlier for prevention it was laba 
plain long acting beta 2 agonist and for acute management it was sabash a short acting beta 2 agonist that's the standard medical teaching but now they are saying for both controlling and relieving low dose ics and formatrol is used i know if you have studied the old data it will look very surprising to you so it is my job to show you the steps or rather the print out or the actual data which is given in the handout of the gina update for asthma that's the world renowned body for asthma care uh, you can yourself in google uh, search gina 2019 update for management of asthma you will download a pdf and you can go through it and scroll through it and this is what he says so i'll just zoom it in for your convenience he says preferred controller step 1 it is as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid and formatrol he has mentioned the fact that if you know it's not available then you can obviously go back by the old protocols but the first word he has written is as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid with formatrol then is written preferred reliever look at what he is saying as needed low dose in ill corticosteroid and formatrol below he has written as needed short acting beta 2 agonist so he is saying that if the low dose ics formatrol combination is not available you can still use the older one so it's not that older one is not to be used he is not said not contraindicated remember my words there it is not that sama is contraindicated what he is saying is that don't treat the symptom he is saying treat the disease and asthma is about inflammation in the lungs when i say inflammation in the lungs there is a enzyme by the name of phospholipase a2 which is responsible for production of inflammatory mediators behind development of asthma he says shut down the phospholipase a2 and the mediators behind synthesis of asthma like leukotrienes will definitely go down and therefore the severity of the disease will also reduce therefore once we get the main message right we have to understand after all when are we going to deploy all this information so the next part of the discussion revolves around what do you mean by controller medication and when would you use this controller medication in the patient asthma patients when they come to you they have the same symptoms you know difficulty in breathing worse at night i can't lie so pain i'm not getting breath i have noisy breathing standard complaints allergic manifestations in a patient but each patient who comes to you is different in a sense that the frequency of symptoms and the severity of symptoms are varying let us consider four asthma patients in my opd today patient number a tells me that uh, doctor i have symptoms but they are like less than 2 days per week symptoms are there patient number b says i have symptoms for let me say 3 days 4 days per week consecutively there is a fourth patient who says symptoms oh i have symptoms daily more worse at night there is a fourth patient who says i have symptoms all through the day as well as the night so you can see that the severity of symptoms will vary in every patient therefore the quality of life will also be interfered let us start from the bottom most patient because symptoms are present all through the day as well by day here i mean 24 hour duration he cannot sleep properly at night therefore he is drowsy at the day time he can't go to his office so he has exhausted all his medical leave and his casual leave and his earned leave and he says that my boss has told me that we will fire you from the job or he might have lost his job extreme limitation of physical activity the patient number 3 is having daily symptoms he can go to his office you know maybe he can hire a uber he can go to his office but he is not able to focus on his work and then uh, there is some limitation of his daily activity his personal relationships have been compromised because he is sick most of the time or let me say that uh, earlier he used to go for running in the morning but this person after the asthma disease manifestations have started or this child cannot participate in school activities so some limitation is there the first two patients however report no limitation in quality of life i have also measured fev1 of the patient the fev1 of the first two patients is perfectly normal more than 80% the third patient is having fev1 between 60 to 80% or less than 60% so what i'm setting the stage for you is that when will i say that my patient is having intermittent asthma then the first category that have created before you is intermittent asthma on the other hand the next category would be called as mild persistent asthma the subsequent could be called as moderate persistent asthma and then is severe persistent asthma for the first patient the treatment will be different from the treatment that will be offered for the last patient so for intermittent asthma 
I will be using inhaled corticosteroids as well as formatrol as and one needed. When I write these steps before you, which I'm gonna explain on the next slide, I want to tell you that the treatment for every asthmatic patient that you see in your OPD will be different from what you've written for the previous patient. First of all, you need to get this table right for intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, severe persistent asthma and then let us understand what do we mean by these steps. What I mean by step one is treatment of a patient of intermittent asthma where I will prescribe low dose inhaled corticosteroids with formaterol. Please remember that low dose inhaled corticosteroid would be budesonide most of the time. You will always ask your patients to rinse their mouth with water after usage of steroids to minimize the risk of oropharyngeal candidiasis. This would be as needed, like he is having attacks once a week, so okay fine, whenever you have the attack, take it. This person has upgraded to mild persistent asthma. He is having now attacks 3 days per week. My prescription to this person would be low dose inhaled corticosteroids daily. Low dose inhaled corticosteroids. This would be continued for next at least 3 to 6 months, sometimes even longer, so that I can cut down on the inflammation in the lungs. Step 3 would be that the person is deteriorated or he is having symptoms now on daily basis. So I will say, okay, you take low dose inhaled corticosteroid with any LABA. It can be formatrol or any other LABA like salmatrol and it would be on a daily basis. So please appreciate the difference between step 1 and step 3 is that step 1 is only when required as needed and in step 3 it is on a daily basis so that you can prevent the attacks from occurring. Step 4 and 5 are at the discretion of a doctor where you will have to increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroids. So it is a medium dose inhaled corticosteroids with a lava. In step 5, you are using high dose that is budesonide going up to 400-800 micrograms on a daily basis. So high dose inhaled corticosteroids with lava. In some cases, you might have to use add-ons also, which I'll explain in the next slide. But I want to explain to you that a decision of a doctor to upgrade from step 3 to step 4 to step 5 or even from step 2 to step 3 is now based on sputum-based management. That is, we do a sputum microscopic examination and if we find that the eosinophils in the sputum, because there are multiple cells that can be demonstrated, if the eosinophils in the sputum, like epithelial cells can be there, if there is an infection, neutrophils can be there. If the eosinophils are demonstrated in an asthmatic person's sputum to be present more than 3%, that means that the person's previous treatment is not working. Like I am giving low dose inhaled corticosteroid with LABA daily and still person is having sputum eosinophilia more than 3%, that means that I have to upgrade to medium dose inhaled corticosteroids. And the moment I treat this, I will again do a sputum. After a few weeks, I will notice sputum eosinophil count should reduce. But if the sputum eosinophil count is persistently more than 3%, in spite of using low dose inhaled corticosteroids, it is time to upgrade to medium dose inhaled corticosteroids. Why they have used a sputum guided treatment now is because of uh, different doctors having different interpretation of this. Like, you know, for a person who is having, let me say, severe persistent asthma, you might be giving step 4, I might be giving step 5. He says two doctors, they should give standard treatment. So both of us, how will we decide? Like initially for any person who's having, we'll go back in the previous slide. If a person is having symptoms all through the day, he's having extreme limitation of quality of life. FEV1 is significantly reduced. I have decided to give step 4 to the patient. Now before I upgrade to step 5, I will be doing a sputum microscope examination, check out the eosinophil count. If it is more than 3%, then I will upgrade to step 5. It has gone down to 3% or lesser then okay i will continue with step 4 treatment only so we are now recommending standardization of treatment because you see every doctor will think from his own thought process and try to treat a case and we are trying to create standard guidelines for treating a patient that is why all this discussion is being done with you let us now understand what are the add-ons here i'll use a different slide to explain the add-ons which are again important from pharmacological perspective the first add-on to be remembered is a teotropium this is a llama that is a long acting muscarinic agent that will reduce the bronchospasm because you see bronchospasm is cholinergic and this is anticholinergic molecule so it will neutralize the bronchospasm of the patient 
The next molecule to be remembered is an anti-immunoglobulin E molecule. We give subcutaneous injections of this, that is omalizumab. This would be given subcut, it is anti-immunoglobulin E. Two cytokines that play an important role in development of asthma is interleukin-5 and interleukin-4. So we are now having drugs which can neutralize the impact of interleukin-4 receptor and interleukin-5 receptor. So I am writing anti-interleukin-5 or 5 receptor and anti-interleukin-4 receptor. The molecules are mepolizumab. and DP lumab. These are additional drugs which are to be used in patients especially if they are having severe persistent asthma. Our objective is to prevent asthma attacks because once they fall sick the hospitalization cost dramatically increases in the patients. For DP lumab, they have also mentioned that this is specially useful in patients who are having severe type 2 asthma. That is again a new term that I'll explain to you because normally we study type 2 diabetes and they're using the word type 2 inflammation in asthma or they're just casually saying type 2 asthma. The description of type 2 asthma would be towards the end of this lecture but that's a new term that is given in the book type 2 inflammation or type 2 asthma where dupilumab is uh, used so I would definitely like you to be aware of this terminology also the details will subsequently follow. Our objective is to prevent the manifestations from developing in the patient. We shall now be discussing regarding management of an acute asthma exacerbation for a person to understand that he is deteriorating we need an objective evidence because every patient will say I am having breathlessness so ideally for objective evidence I will ask the patient to purchase from Amazon or any other medical website a peak expiratory flow rate meter coming with this and the cost is hardly about 400 500 rupees so it's fairly economical i will say and a person will be getting a chart along with this on which it will be mentioned the age of the patient on the x axis height of the patient on the y axis and the gender information a patient can be explained that the peak expiratory flow rate can be looked at with basic mathematic interpretation a person can corresponding to his age weight and gender see what is the peak expiratory flow rate possible for this person and if an asthmatic is having a worsening then obviously the values will become relatively lesser so education of the patient is of paramount importance so that he can start medical care right at home and what is the first step for management of acute asthma exacerbation first step is to increase the dose of the controller medication the controller medication as i've taught you that we start in our patients is low dose inhaled corticosteroids along with formaterol so the dose can be increased up to four times that of normal. To this we can add Saba that is Salbutamol. Salbutamol puffer or meter dose inhaler will always be having a blue cap. They have also tried to do color coding of these various inhalers like Salmetrol long acting will be having a green cap and Saba Salbutamol will be having a blue cap though all companies may not be adhering to these guidelines but recommended is that Salbutamol because the person doesn't know what is Saba and what is Laba. So to explain to a patient you can tell him that the puffer that I'm telling you which is having a blue cap is to be kept with you for emergency usage whenever you are having an exacerbation first increase the dose of controller medication you are not getting relief then add Saba and uh, then subsequently when he comes to you you can add even oral corticosteroids so oral corticosteroids because as I've explained to you steroids will suppress phospholipase A2 which is the main villain behind development of an asthma attack we also need to understand what I mean by a mild exacerbation versus moderate versus severe please appreciate that this that I'm going to teach you is different from mild persistent versus moderate persistent versus severe persistent. Here I'm talking about mild exacerbation versus moderate versus a severe acute asthma. We are going to talk about FEV1 cutoffs here and uh, the partial pressure of oxygen that would be recorded in the patient by if possible a ABG report. In mild asthma the FEV1 is usually about a little more than 70%. Moderate asthma is said to be present when FEV1 is between 40 to 69 percent of the predicted or the best value of the person and if it is less than 40 percent we tend to call it severe asthma. 
please appreciate that when i was teaching you mild persistent and moderate persistent the cutoffs that i was telling you for fev1 were different that is for moderate it was 60 to 80 percent and for severe persistent it is less than 60 percent so these cutoffs are for persistent asthma whereas the ones that we are discussing right now we are discussing for mild moderate and severe exacerbations of asthma the pao2 of the patient will always be normal in mild in moderate it will be something in the range of about a little more than 60 but less than 60 is when cyanosis starts appearing in the patient this is not in percentage but in millimeter of mercury that i'm talking about i'm not talking about saturation of oxygen minded i'm talking about millimeter of mercury so in severe asthma you usually have cyanosis developing in a patient when the po2 becomes less than 60 so this categorization again has to be known because if a person is going from mild to moderate to severe asthma then hospitalization would be required in the patient so when do you need to hospitalize a patient is what we learn next if a person of asthma even after the treatment that i've explained in the previous slide that is i have given a course of oral corticosteroids or i've just started oral corticosteroids saba increase the dose of controller medication there is inability to lie flat in the bed that's one of the indicators that uh, the person needs hospitalization person can't speak or can't talk at all he cannot even say that I am breathless like you know if a person is very breathless he might you know pant like this and say I am not getting breath now this chap he, he can't even talk if the person can't speak also and the person is not even agitated you know hypoxia makes a person angry but in the later part of illness you start having carbon dioxide narcosis because carbon dioxide depresses the brain so person will be very drowsy so if a person of asthma is lying in the bed and he is not responding to commands initial attacks of asthma person will be having these pupils big dilated and he might just physically touch you and say sir i'm not getting breath but this chap is drowsy is lying in the bed that definitely means that i need a hospitalization for the patient fev1 of the patient will dramatically be reduced if fev1 is less than 25 percent that means it is impending respiratory arrest in the patient this is less than 25 percent of the predicted value or the personal best whatever best fev1 value that this person has demonstrated in a spirometry lab when he was well when you compare with this the current value is less than 25 percent it is definitely an indication for hospitalization you have done treatment of the patient post treatment and the fev1 of the patient is still less than 40 percent that is still is in severe acute asthma this is pre-treatment values less than 25 percent post treatment less than 40 percent then these are indications for hospitalization in an asthmatic most of the time in the casualty we might give basic medical care send the patient back home but these aspects that i've taught you this means that you have to admit the patient in the hospital and give care because carbon dioxide narcosis is developing in the patient respiratory muscle fatigue will start developing in a patient and because of this respiratory acidosis the person can expire so let us now discuss regarding a patient who has come into the casualty with the severe acute asthma I have told you that the cutoff for severe acute asthma FEV1 should be less than 40% but that is only a theoretical discussion because a person might be so sick that he may not be able to blow into the mouthpiece of a spirometer, he may not be able to follow your commands. So clinically how will I know that the person is having severe acute asthma? This particular person will not be able to complete sentences. He will be able to maybe talk in words. That is, he will maybe even shake his head, say no or yes, or he may be able to vocalize yes or no, but complete sentences cannot be expected from the patient. You will have an agitated look on the face of the person when you are asking questions. These patients do not like to be quizzed. Like you were saying, are you not getting breath? And he's looking at you with, you know, angry look and saying, are you blind doctor? Can't you see that I'm not getting breath? And the patient will be sitting in a hunched up position with maybe the arms outstretched in front of him. So that is a tripod position that would be adopted by most patients when they're hypoxic. The accessory muscles of respiration will be working over time in the patient sternocleidomastoid working over time will be seen scalenous group of muscles at the roof to the neck flaring of the nostrils it will look as if he has run a half marathon he is sitting on a wheelchair he is sitting on the stretcher in the casualty of a hospital and he is breathing as if his, uh, uh, he has run a half marathon respiratory rate will usually be in excess of 30 per minute the heart rate will also be dramatically fast usually in excess of 120 per minute there is a possibility that pulsus paradoxus may start appearing in the patient.
Pulsus paradoxus is one of the less important criteria for diagnosis of severe acute asthma. Though most doctors, they tend to give too much of importance to the inspiratory disappearance of the pulse. Please appreciate pulses paradoxes can be found in cardiac tamponade. It can be found even in pregnancy, superior vena cava syndrome, right ventricular MI, inferior wall MI in a patient. There are lots of conditions having pulses paradoxes and it may or may not be seen in severe acute asthma. Rather, the features that are said on the top, that is a person is not able to communicate communicate with you that is more or he can't lie flat you know that's another statement that i can say ask a asthmatic patient to lie flat in the bed he is not able to do that and he can't even talk to you that's definitely a cause of concern this means that the person has landed up in severe acute asthma where fev1 is less than 40 percent in this person what will i do i'll definitely admit this person and immediate treatment will be started with oxygen and nebulization with salbutamol there is a possibility that you might be giving nebulization with salbutamol to this patient but fail to attach oxygen behind the nebulization chamber. You will notice that behind the nebulization chamber there is an inlet to which you can attach oxygen. This should be humidified oxygen which is coming from the hospital pipe supply. It should not be oxygen directly from the cylinder. If you give air driven nebulization can cause a ventilation perfusion mismatch and it can even cause worsening of the patient. In fact, this has been a question in the previous years that a doctor has given nebulization with salbutamol. In spite of that, the person is not improving. Why? Because air-driven nebulization was given. So, do not forget to attach humidified oxygen to the backside of the nebulization chamber so that this bronchodilator can be delivered. The salbutamol nebulization should be done every 20 minutes for at least three times in the first one hour and then you can decide on case to case basis whether it is intermittent or continuous nebulization to be given. Usually continuous nebulization is not effective so it's intermittent like every one hourly nebulization would suffice in this case. In some cases there might be a complete airway closure. You see what happens in severe acute asthma is that there is a very severe bronchospasm. I am not worried about bronchospasm because I can control it. But what I'm worried about is Cushman spirals, which can block the airways. You are study or aware from pathology that Cushman spirals are casts of mucus plugs, which can actually block the airways in this person. And uh, therefore, the real fear is that oxygen will not be able to go in hypoxia and carbon dioxide will not be able to come out and carbon dioxide increasing in any asthmatic will make him very drowsy. If an asthmatic patient is very drowsy, it means he is really, really sick. Relatives might think otherwise. They might think that, okay, earlier he was complaining so much to the doctor. He was telling us, I am not getting breath. Now he is sleeping comfortably. So for a non-medico, silent chest might be actually an improvement because earlier there was loud ronca in this person. But later on, in this same patient, you will notice that the silent chest could be developing. So I would like to add a statement here for point number uh, clinical features, loud ronca. Now this why I did not mention earlier is because this is very subjective you see what i say loud you might say that it is okay i mean these ronchi are moderate in intensity so there can be a difference in opinion between two doctors but i want to highlight the fact that loud ronchi disappearing in an asthmatic patient does not mean improvement like this particular case he was admitted with a you know sitting up tripod position in the hospital and now suddenly the ronchi have disappeared and he's very groggy that means he's deteriorated there is a possibility that salbutamol is not working at this point of time. Why? Because if airways will shut down, oxygen will not be able to go in, drug will also not be able to go in. So you might have to give parental bronchodilator subcutaneously to the patient that is terbutalin. Intravenous hydrocortisone should be given 100 milligram start in all asthmatic patients who are having severe acute asthma to again suppress phospholipase A2 which is the villain behind development of asthma. In fact, hydrocortisone has also been documented to potentiate the effect of bronchodilators which you are using here. The next statement that I am saying should be listened with utmost care. In the recommended GINA guidelines 2019, they have mentioned consider magnesium sulfate to be given. Why? Because magnesium is an antagonist of calcium. If you give magnesium sulfate, it will antagonize the effect of calcium and calcium causes contraction. So the bronchoconstriction part can be minimized. I would also like to mention next statement which is mentioned in Harrison. He has mentioned that aminophylline may be considered. I am writing aminophylline plus minus. Why so? Because some guidelines state that aminophylline is not recommended especially because of the toxicity associated with it. 
please appreciate that in earlier years aminophilin was always intravenous aminophilin drip was started in every severe acute asthma patient but now he is saying that do it on a case to case basis in a question where he says which of the drug is not recommended in a patient of severe acute asthma options are salbutamol terbutaline hydrocortisone magnesium sulfate aminophilin five options in the question like nowadays they give five options he says not recommended answer it as aminophilin because this drug can definitely have toxicity it can even contribute to development of arrhythmias so considering that aminophilin is now uh, not being favored by most of the textbooks i would like you to answer this as the least recommended or not recommended drug for the patient instead in place of aminophilin what he started now mentioning is uh, magnesium sulfate to be given to the patient along with this you can also add ipratropium bromide so let's just count the drugs we have given we have given oxion that is considered as a drug salbutamol terbutaline hydrocortisone aminophilin ipratropium these are the drugs along with magnesium sulfate which are to be used in a person of severe acute asthma i have given this treatment to my patient now how do i know that my patient is deteriorating or is not improving to my treatment he cannot talk he has become totally silent earlier at least he could shake his head at least he could answer in monosyllables or shake his head say no or yes to my questions like are you doing fine now he is not i am not getting any answer from the patient the relative is thinking that the patient is sleeping peacefully but that is not the case this indicates carbon dioxide build up and carbon dioxide narcosis which is ensuing in this person the respiratory rate of the patient is anyway more than 30 per minute but along with this i'm not getting a tachycardia now i'm rather surprisingly getting a bradycardia and i'm also noticing that the effort of the patient earlier it was rapid deep breathing accessory muscles of respiration were working over time now it is shallow rapid breathing that's because the muscles of respiration are becoming tired and he will soon go into respiratory arrest sinuses may or may not be appreciated in a dark indian skin i would say so that's why i mentioned it a little at the lower part of the discussion and pulses paradoxes which was initially present i told you pulses paradoxes may or may not be seen but as the person deteriorates pulses paradoxes begins to disappear initially is present then as the person deteriorates the pulses paradoxes will begin to disappear at this moment peak expiratory flow rate or fev v1 of the patient cannot be evaluated but on theoretical grounds i'm mentioning that if fev v1 is less than 25% partial partial pressure of oxygen of the patient is less than 60 and pco2 of the patient is increasing to more than 45 mm of mercury all of these indicate that if i don't intervene right now he will die this presentation that i made before you is called as imminent respiratory arrest so i have divided the discussion of asthma into three parts i have talked about acute asthma severe acute asthma and now i'm talking about imminent respiratory arrest in a patient the points to be remembered are can't talk silent drowsy and all other allied aspects that i mentioned before you in all of these patients elective intubation is to be done in the patient when you have to intubate the patient you have to give neuromuscular blocking drugs and most of these neuromuscular blocking drugs cause vasodilation so they could be crashing of blood pressure i repeat my statement when you are planning to intubate this person you will anyway have to give neuromuscular blockade because you don't want the person to struggle when you intubate the moment you will use neuromuscular drugs the vasodilation will occur and the bp can crash why because he has lost lot of water from the body due to insensible losses he has been breathing very fast and he has not drunk water also because he is very sick so please remember that before you decide to intubate the patient you must ensure hydration so start iv fluids in the patient at this point of time in severe acute asthma I never said start fluids i said run a drip in the patient to ensure a substantial fluid volume in the patient you will now achieve neuromuscular paralysis in the patient and electively intubate the patient okay to the ventilator the ventilator strategy that is used in elective ventilation is called as assisted controlled mechanical ventilation the details of mechanical ventilation have been discussed separately in the emergency medicine section so you can go through that the preferred ventilation modality in any patient requiring elective ventilation is called as acmv mode when you will see the abg report of the patient which is showing a spiking values of pco2 any doctor will be worried and what he will do is he will adjust the settings on the ventilator to increase the inspiratory pressure he says if you will increase the inspiratory pressure it will contribute to barotrauma 
and that is the worst thing that can happen to any patient that you put him on a ventilator to save his life and then introduced a pneumothorax in a patient because you increased inspiratory pressure settings so now the concept is that don't worry if the pco2 is highly elevated to minimize the risk of barotrauma we are now recommending permissive hypercapnia so how much carbon dioxide can be tolerated by our body in permissive hypercapnia the ph of the patient can be as low as 7.3 and the pco to the patient can be up to 50 millimeters of mercury he says don't panic if the values are that high because you can gradually reduce them but not at the risk of inducing a pneumothorax in a patient your bronchodilator drugs will also be working so i'm not writing it but this does not mean that bronchodilator will stop i will continue with hydrocortisone eight hourly in the patient nebulization with salbutamol might occur continuously on one hourly basis ipratropium bromide will also be given so all out aggressive approach will be used in this case why we went aggressive here is simply to prevent the person from going into respiratory arrest because once that happens the hypoxia will cause irreversible brain damage in a patient so we are preempting the possibility of hypoxic brain damage in a patient and that is why this aggressive approach has been used i have today explained to you the following aspects for asthma one is the controller medication which is used for prevention the answer would be given as low dose inhaled corticosteroids with formatorol If he talks about acute exacerbation or just says the word acute asthma, the answer should still be given as low dose inhaled corticosteroids for metrol to which you can add Saba and then add even oral corticosteroids in a patient. However, if he says the word severe acute asthma where the PEF or the forced expiratory volume of the patient would be less than 40%, then you will have to answer nebulization with salbutamol in the patient along with IV hydrocortisone. If he says imminent respiratory arrest, then elective intubation of the patient is recommended. The patient should be put on assisted controlled mechanical ventilation. Last but not the least, I will talk about an asthma which is so severe that a person can die within a matter of hours. This highly severe form of asthma is called as brittle asthma. In brittle asthma, the diurnal variation of peak expiratory flow rate can be as much as more than 40%. Remember, I taught you asthma will mainly be having a nocturnal deterioration. I'm saying diurnal deterioration or variation can be more than 40%. Please appreciate this is not 40% value. I'm saying that 40% fluctuation, whatever is the maximum PFR value, more than 40% can fall and person can be so sick that he will not be able to even talk. In these patients, I will ask them to purchase what is called as EpiPen. This is the auto injector that he has to keep with him in his pocket all the time. If he has an attack, all he needs to do is inject himself with subcutaneous epinephrine. And this will take care of the exacerbation that the person has suffered from. And just to explain regarding brittle asthma, I can say from my personal experience, one of my students, uh, when I was taking a face to face class, this was way back about two years ago in Hyderabad. And one of my students in between the class, he was going in and out. And uh, well, that uh, I did not come to know because there were multiple students. But after the class, he came to me. He said that when I sit in a closed environment, like a lot of students are sitting in a class and uh, then air conditioner is running at full blast so i tend to feel suffocated so he told me that he's an asthmatic and he was feeling suffocated so he went out to have his inhaler and then when he felt better he came back in the class but he missed out on a couple of notes so he was asking me a soft copy of the notes from my computer so i happily gave it to him and while that discussion he told me that he is an asthmatic and the last attack that he had was so bad that he could not even talk he said that I think my lips started turning blue and the attacks that I develop sometimes can be so bad that I think that I may not even reach the hospital. Luckily, he was staying in the hospital campus, so he managed to reach the hospital. His friends took him there, but he said that I don't know. My attacks have been so bad that I think I can die. On listening to him, I just casually said, I think you have brittle asthma and you must purchase a EP pen and keep it with you in your pocket all the time. Because if the attacks are very severe, like maybe you are somewhere where you are distant or far away from the hospital, you may not reach the hospital on time. 
uh, unfortunately this chap you know he, he cleared the PG entrance exam then he got orthopedics in Osmania University and uh, after the exam he went with his friends to a seafood restaurant and a couple of doctors were enjoying seafood now you are aware that uh, you see seafood can be allergenic and asthmatics can be allergic to various items including seafood, prawns etc. So while eating food suddenly he started having this choking sensation and his friends thought that maybe a fish bone got impacted in the throat or maybe he's choking on food so somebody is offering him water or somebody is patting on his back whereas he was having this uh, acute attack of asthma which deteriorated into a severe acute attack and then an imminent respiratory arrest. The attack was so bad that he died. Later on when I communicated with one of his friends, his friends told me that he was trying to signal uh, to get something from the car and later on, unfortunately, when they opened the glove compartment of his car, they found this EpiPen injection. He had purchased that EpiPen injection, it was lying in the glove compartment of his car and he did not use it uh, or he could not use it because obviously it was not accessible and his friends, I, why I am telling you this is, you know, a doctor was having such a severe manifestation and if he could not communicate what is happening to him, you can obviously understand what non-medical people or ordinary people would go through whenever it comes to aspects of brittle asthma in a patient. So these are the details that I want you to understand for this topic and especially these aspects of changes in treatment that I've explained to you are of paramount importance for this topic. Another aspect I would highlight once again is permissive hypercapnia. Do not do permissive hypercapnia in head injury patients because carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. Listen to this carefully. Carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. It will dilate the brain blood vessels, it will worsen the cerebral edema and the raised acidity of the patient. So permissive hypercapnia is contraindicated in persons of raised ICT. Permissive hypercapnia is recommended for patients who are having imminent respiratory arrest and asthma. It is also recommended for severe acute exacerbation of COPD but is contraindicated in patients of raised intracranial pressure. So these are the details that I want you to go through. Keep working guys and I am very sure you will come out with flying colors. Thank you so much for listening.